If you'd said to me, say, uh, 30 years ago, that I was going to have a career in teaching, that wouldn't have been a massive surprise, because I was always either going to be a teacher or a Blue Peter presenter. <laughs> I was a child of the 70s. It was all about Leslie Judd, cheesecloth, crossover skirt, head square, sticky back plastic. Um, and when the call from the BBC didn't come, I made my way into teaching. What would have really surprised me, though, is if you'd said you are going to specialize with early years, because who the hell wants to teach early years? Blimey. Who wants to teach little children? I remember saying in a staff room once, oh, I've got a teaching practice in reception, and a teacher saying, oh, couldn't do early years. All that body fluid. Oh. <laughs> and in that, there is a lot of truth. If you work in early years, there is a lot of body fluid, uh, depending on the age of the children that you work with. Oh, and it's not just... Uh, Restricted to body fluid, there's also the head lice. Uh, there is nothing like lying in bed with your wife, gazing into her eyes, her back into yours, until she utters that magic Friday night praise. There's something moving in your hair. <laughs> That's nice. There's nothing like saying to your three teenaged boys, what's for pudding, Dad? Oh, I thought you might like some of this white worm medicine. That's right. <laughs> Dad's got the worms again. Uh -huh. That's all good. And of course, a lot of early years is very centered around we and poo. <laughs> we and two poo takes a large precedent with early years children. So you will get the, um, <laughs> I've done a poo. <laughs> oh, which is bettered by the toilet cubicle door banging open, only to see a child with their pants round their ankles backing out saying, I finished, I finished. <laughs> Or my own personal favorite, I've done a poo. <laughs> Which has happened more than once. Or the child who says, will you fasten my lace? Will you fasten my lace? Put your foot, foot, put your foot down. You're going to have my eye out. Why doesn't your mother send you in Velcro like the rest of the numbnuts? Get your foot on here. <laughs> oh, your laces are wet. Have you been outside? And for the really specialist early years people in the audience, sweaty tight syndrome. We're just coming out of it now. Where somebody will come with some 40 denier mangled tights in their hand. Can you do me tights? <laughs> so early years is a magical place. Why wouldn't you want to teach there? Um, and so I always thought I would teach juniors, proper children who could do stuff. My mum was a teacher. I am a child of a teacher. We who are teachers curse our children because we are teachers. And we can't let a moment pass without it being an educational opportunity. <laughs> Can we stay in a hotel? No, let's stay in a tent. <laughs> and while we're on holiday, let's make a project book for you to take back to school for your teacher. <laughs> Every bloody holiday. You'd go back in and say, we've made another project book. And he'd say, yeah, that's lovely. I'll read it at playtime with me coffee. You could tell it had never been read. So I thought I was going to teach juniors, children who could do stuff. I'd been in staff rooms and heard people say, ooh, Barbara in year three, she's not coping. Tell you what, put her in early years for a year. <laughs> if anything's going to tip Barbara over the edge, it's going to be a year in early years. Why? Well, all they do is they faff about in the sand and read stories, that's about it. In fact, if they did less faffing in the sand and a bit more phonics, we wouldn't be in the state that we're in at the moment. <laughs> that kind of thing going on. So, when I actually got myself into early years, um, loads of things that nobody told me about. Nobody told me about the poo, nobody told me about the wee, nobody told me about the nits, but neither had anybody told me about the magic. And I think that's why I kind of stayed, because it's that realization you are at the very beginnings of the education path, and it's special time. It is really special time. If you get it wrong then, you've got it wrong for a long time to come. So this is the time when you need to massively engage children in the learning process. So I very quickly realized the early years has got a lot of wee and poo in it, is a lot of fun. It's also a really, really important part of a child's journey into education. And we have to get it right. It's why we need quality in our early years provision, but also why we need to offer children a curriculum that meets the needs of human beings, because children are abstract. The world they live in is abstract, but the curriculum we give them isn't abstract. 
Children don't think often in the way that we think. You can be there with a group of children in front of you, being a, an amazing early years practitioner, and you're there saying, and then there's this, and then there's that, and they're all looking at you, and you think, I am God's gift to the early years. And a hand will go up, and you're like, right, you are my money moment. Come, impart me with your knowledge. And they will say, my dog is dead. <laughs> your dog's dead? We're talking about 2D shape. What do you mean your dog's dead? And then what always happens is it becomes a dead off. So another hand will come up. My hamster is dead. Oh, that's sad. Then pierced resistance. My granddad's dead. I can't talk about spheres now, can I? Oh, so... Early years children and children in general, learners are abstract. We should be creating learning environments that enhance children's exploration of the world. If I am two, three, four, five years old and something happens to me, I haven't got a back catalogue of things that I can insert that into to make sense of it. I need an environment that allows me to revisit what's going in my head because it's all a bit nuts. I remember once being in a role play area with a child who got a baby doll by the leg, <laughs> and dropped it in a box and said to our friend, that doll's in baby prison. <laughs> All right. And then she said, because when you go to prison, right, you get a letter, and you have to take the letter with you, and there's a lady on a phone in a window, and she says, have you got your letter? What's your name? What's the name of your babies? Go and sit in that room, because a man's going to come, and he's going to look in your bag and see if you've brought anything naughty. That wasn't Goldilocks and the Three Bears, nor was it Fung Wah's Chinese restaurant. But her little friend went, all right, okay. And they said, shall we play baby prison? She went, all right then. She went, all right, got all the dolls. You're the lady. And she came in into that little director play where she said, right, ask me what my name is. What's your name? Ask me, did you get your letter? Did you get your letter? Tell me, to go, tell me to sit in that room. This man's going to come to me. Today. A lovely little moment in play where they got to explore something that had obviously happened to her that she needed to make sense of, that she needed to rethink. So children are abstract. Learning is abstract. So we need abstract learning opportunities for children. Chance for them to go and explore an environment or listen to teaching that's about their interests. I get told all the time, oh, Alistair, can you come and help us narrow the gap? Oh, Alistair, I've got these reluctant learners. We are not born reluctant learners. Boys are not born reluctant writers. It is true, the majority of boys do have a very rare condition which only really affects boys. It's called writer's poo. <laughs> Every time you say to an early years child, shall we write about that? Oh no, I need a poo, oh. <laughs> because they know poo is the one thing where you could never say, no you don't, you've just been, no it's coming out, <laughs> run, run. So, writer's poo aside, lots of times we kind of try and hoodwink children into learning. What we want for our children, all of our children, but especially in early years, is this idea of magic in the broader sense, that I've got something in this environment that interests me. Because as really good teachers and really good practitioners, we are great at the whole big eyes, whispery voice, jazz hands. And what we do is we create false magic for children. Well, they were liars. We say things like, Connor, Connor, put down that construction, put it down. Come and do a special job with me. Come on, <laughs> special job. He thinks, oh my God, I've been chosen for this special job. Come on, into the cloakroom, into the cloakroom. Come and sit next to me, little assessment sheet. What's that word say? What's that word say? <laughs> next time she says, come on, Connor, come and do a special job. Oh, I need a poo, you need a poo. <laughs> or we do the thing where we go and we think it makes us good. And it doesn't, you're there, you've got your 30 children in front of you, your two difficult ones sat either side, <laughs> really difficult one right between your legs, so you can give them a gentle squeeze if they misbehave. No, really don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> and you'll say things like, oh, I've got a really bad, oh. and they look at you like, oh my God. God, she's whispering, she's doing wide eyes, and she's got a thing that she's calling a feely bag. I wonder what's in my feely bag. Oh, oh my God, it's a snake. <laughs> they would like to come and put their hand in my feely bag. Oh. 
yes, well, I might have chosen you, Connor, had your carpet behavior been a little better, so think <laughs> about that for next time. And we always go for the safe bet, always well-behaved child, often girl, 12 o'clock. Come on, Charlotte, come on, Charlotte. Now, Charlotte always thinks it's a great idea until she gets halfway out. I don't want to put my hand in the bag. Get your hand in the bloody bag, you're ruining the moment, come on! Come on, Charlotte, get your hand in the bag. So Charlotte pops her hand in the bag and literally you could hear a pin drop. Boys are nipping their willies with excitement. <laughs> it's all going on. And then the big money moment comes. Have you got something, Charlotte? Yes. What have you got? I don't know. <laughs> Pull it out of the bag. Oh, well done, that's a triangle. Well done, Charlotte. <laughs> a triangle? I wanted a tarantula, I wanted a snake, I wanted chocolate, I didn't want a bloody triangle. <gasps> Who else would like to put their hand in my bag? No, I need a poo, I need a poo. <laughs> so, children aren't born reluctant, so what goes wrong? And the answer is we go wrong, we do things like that. We say, oh gosh, right, got to get these boys right and got to get these boys right. And <gasps> Barbara, Barbara, he's in the writing area. You get the assessment, I'll block the exits. <laughs> and that poor child who ventured into the writing area once is pounced upon by a woman with a worksheet and never goes back again. No child ever comes in and says, oh, you've put some tricky words in the sand. Get in. Lads, drop your scooters. Come on, it's tricky words in the sand. Come on. The more lads go, oh, she's put words in the sand. Don't go in. Don't make eye contact with her. We do not come into contact with a generation of reluctant learners, reluctant writers, reluctant readers. It's us that do that to children. And why do we do it? Because we give them a curriculum that isn't about the way the children learn. We, give, we make our children reluctant because children are driven by a desire to succeed and they avoid failure because they don't like it. It doesn't feel very nice. So when you say, come and do this, and then it doesn't turn out like I expected it to. The next time you say, oh, come and do this. No, you're right, I won't bother. But if we could dress what we want children to do within their learning environment, where we base our teaching on children's interests, that's where the excitement comes. So when I talk about being a subversive teacher, what I'm talking about is getting back to teaching in the way that children learn. Stop being a deliverer and start being a teacher. Start looking at your children and thinking, right, you are a random lot and that's why I love you. But in my space, have I got things that interest you? Have I got things that motivate you? Am I going to allow you to invent and discover? Am I going to be a bridge to your learning? And am I going to do that through effective play-based environment where you can go indoors, where you can go outdoors and find out all about the world outside? I said to one practitioner I was working with, when do you open your doors, Pauline? She said, oh, about 11. I said, why do you wait till 11 to open your doors? Should I tell you this, Alistair? Because when you open the doors, they go out. <laughs> and that's what we're dealing with. So, we want to be subversive teachers. We want to be subversive educators that say, I know there is an immense amount of pressure from the government, from the curriculum, and all things that don't seem to be actually based on real children or how real children learn. We want to be creating learning spaces that support children's learning through their interests so that we're not having to pull 2D shapes out of a theory bag. We're not having to bury tricky words in our sand. We're on about saying we are going to take learning into the space with you and we're going to learn together. So when we are going back into our settings, if you work in a setting or if you're someone who influences practice, when you go back, yes, all of those important markers the children need to learn, but go back and look again and think, am I really teaching or am I just delivering? Is my space a space that cultures that excitement, that want to learn, or is it a space that's going to create that gap and make that reluctant learner? And if you haven't had the opportunity to work in early years, go and do it. It is the most magical place. My only one final and very important piece of advice is, if you work in early years, please, please, please wash your hands. <laughs> Thank you very much.